This is Matthew Webb with the University of Tennessee Extension. Um, this is a presentation on fence line hay feeders. To give you a summary of what a fence line hay feeder is, it is a hay feeding system that is built within an existing fence line. In this example here, we have a traditional hay ring that has been built within the fence line. This hay ring has been put on a feed pad that is geotextile covered with chert. And so the cattle are on one side of the fence while the operator or producer who is feeding the hay is on the opposite end of the fence. And so this allows the operator to feed cattle efficiently, safely, but it also allows these cattle to feed on a feed pad that gets them out of deep mud and uh, it can allow for some time and safety efficiencies uh, that is beyond our traditional hay ring feeding system. So in this presentation today, we're going to talk about some of those benefits, but we're also going to talk about some of the things you need to watch out for as far as constructing these feeders. Before we start, uh, I wanted to express some appreciation to a handful of entities um, in Marshall County we were able to copy some of the things that we saw on the Eden Shell Farm in Owenton, Kentucky. Uh, they came out with a series of fence line hay feeder models uh, that was developed and planned by Dr. Steve Higgins who is um, below. He is with the University of Kentucky uh, dealing with agriculture engineering um, both of those entities were were more than willing to pass on ideas to us so we could try some of these things out here in Tennessee. So I would encourage you to check out the Eden Shell Farm website as well as Dr. Steve Higgins and the many publications that he has come up with for efficient cattle and um, farm infrastructure publications that he has developed. The farm crew at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center located in Lewisburg uh, did an excellent job of, of building these feeders and allowed us to try these out for the last couple of winters. And so we're going to be talking about some of the things that we saw, what we liked, what we wish we could have done better as we move along in this presentation. So some of the benefits that we're seeing and as well as what we've talked to other uh, research entities and also producers is that there's a time management benefit. There's a safety benefit with those cattle being on one side of the fence and you as operator feeding, feeding hay being on the other side of the fence. As long as those feeders are constructed correctly, there's less hay waste. There's some animal health and performance issues because those animals are not constantly in deep mud during the winter months trying to feed. And then also, if we put some ideas to paper in, in thoughtful consideration, we can reduce some issues with environment or pasture damage that we see in traditional hay feeding systems. In this picture here, this is a producer in Marshall County. This is his bull lot. Uh, you can see that he has put a, a hay ring feeder into the fence line. He's got his tire water trough to the right. So when he goes to feed his bulls, he's always on one side of the fence and the bulls are on the other. So that, that has allowed him to be more efficient in his time, but also has been safer for him and has prevented him from having to walk into the field every time to feed his bulls. Just so you don't forget what it looks like, here is a typical hay feeding um, scene, in, at least here in Tennessee, and I'm, I'm sure it is all across um, the southeastern United States as well as other parts of the world. But we have mud here, and you can see with these, these dairy heifers, uh, we can see mud marks up to their knees and also along their bellies. Um, we can see the three hay rings out here in the field and we got this circle of 
of goo that has developed around each one of these hay feeders. We can see some of the wasted hay that has that has been either pulled out or blown out by the wind from these feeders. You can see the tractor tracks as the operator was trying to move in and out of the field to feed uh, round bales to these cows through the winter. And so we can obviously see there's going to be some pasture damage here. There's going to be some compaction from hoof traffic. There's going to be some compaction due to tire traffic. Um, we see that the area is void of a lot of vegetation. And another issue of concern is that to the left there with those line of trees, there is a small branch that runs into a creek. And so we have to be mindful of water issues and environmental issues. Uh, in our hay feeding system. The effects of mud on cow performance. This is some data from the University of Nebraska where they looked at feedlot cattle, but there's a lot of correlations between some of those conditions and some of the conditions that we see on farms during the winter feeding phase. But they looked at the effect of mud um, at different depths, and these were all done during a time of the year when temperatures range from the 20s to the upper 30s. And so we looked at no mud, dew claw deep, shin deep, below the hawk, hot deep, and belly deep. And you can see there that for each instance as the mud got deeper that there was a loss of animal performance, a loss of gain that was associated with that. And then we also have to remember that these animals are spending a lot of energy as they're trying to walk through the mud. But also, if they're getting their hides muddy and wet and it being cold, the air temperatures being cold, that has certainly has an effect on their performance and how much they're going to eat and how much their weight gain is going to be. Here's a chart that shows some other health issues that may be associated with uh, feed intake as we go from four to eight inches of mud compared with no mud, then they may need to eat 5 to 15% more feed to compensate for, for the extra energy they're spending trying to walk through the mud. If we get from a foot to two feet of mud, that jumps up to 30%. So they, they just can't eat enough to keep up with it. So keep in mind that every four inches of mud results that those animals need 7% more energy to keep up with that weight gain. Also, you know, younger cattle are affected your calves. Uh, if those muddy conditions are, if we get some very nasty uh, conditions, then we can get some infections in their navel. It may end up with some navel ill or joint ill where they cause some stiffening in their joints. They may scour because the environment's not clean. If their hide, if their hair gets wet and temperatures are cold, we may end up issues with hypothermia. If those if those babies get stuck in the mud, they may get trampled on by older cattle. And again, if the environment's not clean, we may also have coccidia issues. Older cattle, you know, if the conditions stay wet and muddy all the time, then we may end up with some foot rot or scald issues between the hooves between the toes of the hoof. Uh, we may have some inflammation and lameness issues and conception rates may go down. Uh, one is because those cattle are spending a lot of energy trying to walk through the mud and so they're trying to eat more to maintain themselves and an animals going to maintain themselves before they put any extra energy towards reproduction or or anything else. And on the flip side of that you have to remember the bull too. A bull is only as good as his feet, and if he is concerned about the ground conditions of him mounting any cows, then he may not do what we intend him to do. So some conception rates uh, may falter because of excessive money conditions. This is on the same farm on the same day. Uh, we kind of saw a similar picture there on the left where we have these dairy heifers and they're standing in in mud that is over their ankles. In some cases, some of them may be up to their knees on the back side on that second feeder in the back. 
And you compare that to the, the Charlotte heifer there on the right where she is standing on a on a feed pad that's been constructed with geotextile and chert um, there with the fence line feeder and you can see her hooves and so this was a picture taken in 2018 it was a very wet winter and um, so conditions you can see that conditions are muddy but it allowed the, those that beef heifer there in that scenario there you just don't see the amount of mud on her as you do with the dairy heifers there on the left. So some possibilities or some design ideas. You can put these fence line hay feeders in areas not only for your winter feeding areas, but they also could be used in a weaning or a receiving area. We know that when we have freshly weaned cattle or if we buy cattle, uh, straight from a stock yard that the first thing they're going to do is try to walk around and find either their mama or their herd mates uh, from their prior farm and so with a lot of these fence line feeders a lot of these designs where they are they are stuck out perpendicular to the fence line and they are filled with hay which most cattle are going to be familiar with then they're going to be forced to walk into feed and so that may encourage them to go ahead and start eating and calming down when we when we bring those new cattle home they can also be used in a sacrifice area area for drought feeding and so that we we constrict those animals to one area of the farm so that the other areas of the farm are not um, grazed down or overgrazed during a drought and so we can manage that one area as a sacrifice area but they can also be used in a pasture rotation this picture here is from the Eden Shell Farm in Kentucky. Um, this this particular fence line hay feeder is a four bell feeder, and it is built within a pasture rotation of four different pastures, and so they are able to rotate those animals and still give them access to hay through the pasture rotation if they need to do so. This is from the Eden Shell Farm as well. This is in front of the previous picture that you saw. Um, but this is built within a existing structure. This was an old dairy farm uh, there at the Eden Shell Farm. It is now, uh, now um, managed by the Kentucky Beef Network. And um, they worked with Dr. Steve Higgins on being able to reuse some of these structures that they had this particular area had a lot of concrete so they added this six bell feeder uh, to this existing infrastructure and it's very handy that they are able for instance with the barn there there's a handling facility within the barn if they have a heifer or cow that's having trouble calving they can bring her in and and work that heifer or cow that's having calving difficulties and then they can leave her in the barn. They can actually take um, this gate here and open it up to this post. And then she will be able to stay in a pen and have access to not only water that's located in the barn, but also access to hay in the feeder. And then on, on this side of the picture, on this side of the gate, there is a place for, for manure storage. So they can go in there and clean this feeder out during the winter at some point, store that manure and put that manure in places that it's needed. This is some pictures that were borrowed from a blog that Dr. Steve Higgins did. Another illustration of putting these fence line hay feeders within existing infrastructure. But also with the idea of, of time management, safety, and also meeting the animal's needs. So from this, this photograph from Google Earth of this particular producer's farm in, in the middle part of Kentucky, we can see that we have our hay storage there on the left. 
Uh, the square area there in the middle is the cow feeding or the fence line hay feeder uh, system that's located in the middle. Also, we have a smaller building there kind of to the right that is his handling facility that's made within this system. So if he has all of his cows up eating hay, all he has to do is close gates. He has them confined and he can work them through the handling facility if he chooses to. He also has a set of lanes that go out to other pastures. So if he's got some stockpile fescue or some other winter grazing, then he can open the gates to those appropriate fields. And those cows can go back and forth between the hay and their grazing. He also has a creep area uh, for the calves. So there is a creep gate there that only the calves can access through. They can get their own feed or their own hay separate from mama. And hopefully we can add a few more pounds because they're not having to compete with the cows. So there's a picture of that particular feeder. Uh, you can see that um, it's on a good pad. Um, those cows have access to a lane that's on the back side of this feeder. The building there to the left is the handling facility. So like I said before, all he has to do is shut the gates. And he has those animals confined and he can work those animals through the handling facility if he needs to do so. This is a picture of the, the creep area. So those calves have their own access to feed or hay. The hay storage is at the back. And you can kind of see a little bit of the, the hay feeding structure uh, there on the left right in front of the hay barn. So... Um, it's nice for that producer because all he has to do is uh, go in and crank the tractor up, st stick a spear in the bale, turn around, and he's right there where he needs to feed that hay to. And so, and that's all of it's opened up enough to where he can work some equipment through those feeders and, and scrape that manure and put that manure somewhere where it's needed. So on the next few slides here, I want to do a comparison between the Eden Shell um, hay feeders and the feeders that were constructed at the Middle Tennessee Education Research Center in Lewisburg. And so here's what they kind of call the limousine model. And both of them have their associated cost at the bottom. But the Eden Shell feeders there on the left, they're both covered. Um, in the Eden Shell picture, they use wood posts. And they bolted their their cattle panels to or their feed panels to the post. Whereas at the Lewisburg location, they used metal posts because they didn't want to have to go back and change out posts very often through concrete. Uh, but those those feed panels are chained to the post, and so if they ever have to clean the inside of the feeders, all they have to do is zip the chains off. And they can move those and they can and they can clean the inside of the feeders if they need to do so. The next model, uh, what they term as the Cadillac, is kind of the it's the same top model that you saw before minus the roof. Uh, both of these had concrete pads. Also notice too that the inside of the feeders have been raised up. Um, higher than the surrounding feed pad and we're going to talk about why that is important in later slides uh, but both of these are the same as the ones before um, the only difference is is there's no roof this is kind of the four-door sedan um, there's some differences between these two here and the Eden shell example they did concrete the inside of the feeder and raise it up higher than the surrounding feed pad. But the outside, the feed pad itself around the feeder is, is a grid that they used as well as geotech style with gravel. Uh, so that is different from the Lewisburg one in that the Lewisburg, um, they, their feed pad was geotech style with chert on top because chert was a little cheaper option for for this location and they did use metal panels uh, for theirs in Lewisburg.
This is a two-door sedan. Both of these are kind of a do-it-yourself model. Uh, they used uh, wood paneling. They can be easily constructed. Um, some differences between these two here. The one in the Eden Shell example, um, what they did is they took a 2x8 and at the bottom and they filled the inside of that feeder with larger gravel rock. And the outside of the feeder is a geotech style with a gravel pad. At the Lewisburg location it is once again a chirp pad on geotech style. And a difference with those feed panels versus the Eden Shell fence panels is that they put a gate on the back side of this feeder. So if they ever had to drive through to clean any hay out of the inside of the feeder, they could open the gate, whereas they don't have that option with the Eden Shell model. And then lastly, this is what they're terming a two-door hatchback. Uh, this is a hay ring model, and it's simply taking a your typical three-piece hay rings and using two pieces. So if you buy two hay rings that are three-piece hay rings, you can make um, three feeding stations from those two hay rings. And... Um, in the Eden Shell model, that one is on just a rock and geotextile feed pad. That hay ring is bolted to the fence. There is a gate, which I would highly recommend if you have a cow calf, because we know we're going to get a calf to jump in that ring at some point. Uh, whereas at the Lewisburg location, we're using a geotextile chirp pad once again. Uh, it, those feeders are chained to the to the post, and since at this location they're developing heifers, uh, they did not put gates on the back side, and they've not had any issues so far with heifers getting to the hay range. So, um, if you're doing cow calf or smaller stalkers, I would definitely put a gate on the back side of these feeders. So layout suggestions. Uh, your location is is probably the most critical part of this whole deal because if you put it in the wrong spot, there's really no point in putting these things in. Uh, we will light ridge tops in flatter areas away from natural water resources. We don't want to build these things in, in creek bottoms. We don't want to put them in places where moisture is going to collect and, they, and that water or that moisture can't move away from these feed pads. If we are building these feeders um, within proximity of a natural water source, a creek or a branch, then we may want to use buffers. You know, these grass strips uh, that will catch some of the sediment that's, that's washing off of these, these feed pads. And um, we want them in close proximity to other structures, a good road. You know, the idea is, is that we're on one side of the fence and the cows are on the other side of the fence. So we want a good road so we're not getting ourselves or the tractor stuck in the mud. So a good road on the opposite side of the fence from the cattle. Close to the hay barn so we can keep that trip down to a minimum. We can reduce the amount of time it takes to feed these animals. It would be real handy if they were close to working facilities so we can, we can close these animals off while they're feeding, while we got them up. And then we can simply work them through the facilities without having to chase cattle all over the property. We can do uh, these fence line feeders within a pasture rotation. And uh, that would be good from the standpoint that if we, if we did need to move those cattle to a cleaner environment, uh, particularly during calving or, or to give the grass a break, we can do that. Waters, we want 150 feet away uh, from these feeders. And the reason for that is, is is clean up around these feeders. If we can put waters 150 feet away, then it forces those cows to walk away from the feed pad. They can spread their own manure on their own, and that's just a lot less clean up on our part around these feeders. And then your design aspect. Um, it could be that we're using rented ground 
And if that case, if that is the case, then we might want to use the the hay ring structures if we're if we're um, running a larger amounts of cattle on our own places, then we might want to use some of the feed panel type um, setups. And and those are scalable. A lot of the examples we've seen so far have been two bell feeders. And uh, I'll show you the layout for that in just a moment. But they're scalable. And so you can make them as long as you want. I'm told that if a tractor is a 50 horse tractor, it can push six bales if we have a concrete bottom to the inside of these inside of these feeders they will slide so that that is appropriate so you know it depends on what you want to do if i had 30 cows and i only wanted to go out and feed them once or twice a week then i might be more interested in the six bell feeders like i said if i'm on rented ground and i know that i'm going to eventually move away from that property I might want to use more of the hay ring type structure so I can I know I can take those with me when I leave. To give you a story on this picture here, and something to think about is that you know we could put these feeders in different spots of the farm. Uh, this is once again at the Eden Shell Farm, and this is a hillside pasture that is used after those cows have calved. Uh, they put those cows in an area that's a, that is flatter, that is easier on those mamas to calve, uh, where the operator can easily find those cows or those calves when they're calving, so he can go out there and ear tag and do what he needs to do. Uh, but then those calves are and cows are moved to this area, to this this particular pasture with these feeders, and it has had some fescue that is stockpiled. Uh, that pad is not being used all winter, so it's cleaner for those calves. If they want to come up and find a dry spot, then they're on a they're on a feed pad that's not full of mud. And so, don't feel like that you are restricted to just one area of the farm or or just for one purpose. You know, these might be something where you could scatter them around and use them strategically within your your calendar of the year of your management. So this is a this is a plan from the University of Kentucky, and this is the the feed panel design here. But it's it's roughly 30 feet wide. Um, the length of it is dependent on on how long you want the feeder. This is a two bell feeder design here. It's 12 foot long, is eight foot wide. Um, in this scenario, they're using a raised concrete pad inside and concrete on either sides, but you can adjust that accordingly. Um, there has been some designs in Kentucky where they've raised the, they've had the, a raised concrete area inside the feeder and the two feet around the the feeder is concrete and the rest of it is a geotech style gravel pad and the reason for that and we'll show you a picture of this in a minute is as those cattle walked up to the feeder they their front end is heavier and they will dig some of the gravel away from the feeder around the outside of the feeder and so that will have to be replaced at some point so by using concrete on those two feet around the feeder that just reduces the opportunity that you'll have to do that later on so I want to talk about some issues obviously it's a cost um, these are more expensive than going and buying your traditional hay rings and, and moving them around um, so there's a the cost there there's manure and waste management what are you going to do with the manure because these these pads will have to be cleaned off at some point. I know many of you probably will pile up manure at the, uh, there somewhere in within the field or you're constantly moving hay rings around. Um, so that may not be something no different than what you're already doing. I tend to think of that as more of a positive though because we can pile that manure up save it and use it in an area that really needs it at some point in the future when conditions are better for spreading it hay quality 
I think if you're using average quality hay in these systems, you don't really have any issue. But if we're using very mature hay, something like Johnson grass hay that can get very stemmy, or even some of the sorghum sudans or pearl melts that got cut late, and um, we got a stalk that's very stemmy, and that cow's going to select away from it, then you're going to have some of that waste that's going to be on the inside of those feeders. And so you're going to have to clean that out eventually. And then the maintenance. That's the reason I have this picture here within this presentation. I recognize that this is not a feeder. This is a waterer. But you can already see where some of the rock and some of the chert that is around this concrete pad that the, this water sits on has been washed away or washed away because of hoof traffic. So we know on a lot of things around the farm we have to maintain them. So in this example we're going to have to add some chert or some rock at some point. And these fence line feeders will be no different. So here's the example of, of maintaining some of these structures. You can see there along the, the feeders there that we're starting to get a dip form uh, forming right along the feeder where as those animals walk up, you know, the, the front end of the cow it tends to be a little heavier and she's they dig around um, around the feeder there. So we're at some point in the future we're gonna have to add some more rock or chert around these feeders so we can maintain that pad so here in Lewisburg we've we've had the opportunity to use these fence line hay feeders the last couple of winters and um, there's some things that we've noticed about location and feed pad construction and roof designs the the feeder pad uh, the feed pad that those animals are using how wide these these um, these feeders are the type of feed panels you want to use and then just like with your traditional hay feeding systems you're going to have to do some a little bit of repair around these feeding areas so we're going to talk about that for the next few slides as i said before location ideal in flat well drained areas or ridge tops access to a road close to hay storage we have actually timed uh, hay feeding using the fence line hay feeders versus traditional hay rings and we found that depending on where these feeders are placed that we can reduce the time to feed from 35 to 57 percent compared to a hay ring because we're not having to get down off the tractor and open and close gates and, and fight cows off. So here's a picture here that is not an ideal location. Um, and this uh, was kind of built at the bottom of a hill and uh, we're to be frank we didn't really pay attention how ran, how the water runs off that hill so it kind of runs off the hill there and as that water or that moisture is running off the hill it runs sideways into these feeders so essentially these feeders become dams for for the moisture that runs off and and we are working on our third winter we just come out of our third winter where it was extremely wet 2018 2019 and 2020 um, have all been wet years and so we've had a excellent opportunity to see how well these things are going to hold up and uh, another thing about this location that you need to really pay attention to is that there is not a good opportunity there is no gates close by to allow any equipment to come in around these feeders and clean up when conditions are this bad and so as you're designing these 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 fence line hay feeders design them where there's a gate close by so you can get in and out with equipment if you need to go in there and uh and clean these up and you know a lot of hay was wasted through these systems right here just because of the excess of moisture that was being wet up by the hay because of where this was constructed. So feed pad construction pads need to be constructed where water moves away from the feeders on the back side of the feed pads, not from the sides. It needs to be rolling off the back. You need at least a 2% slope to accomplish this. 
As I said before, pay attention to your fence design and gate placement around the feed pad so you can get your equipment in and out efficiently. And in some locations, it may be to your advantage to have some concrete bunkers arranged for manure storage. And so this, this is another pad here that was at the Lewisburg location. This is a concrete pad. And though it looks it's very muddy around this pad, this mud is only actually two or three inches deep. It, it w looks worse than what it really is. And so, you know, my first glance at, at this pad, and this was this picture was taken in January of 2020. I thought, man, it's very deep. But uh, when you walked out there, it was no more than two or three inches deep. So that was. A, that was a pleasant surprise, but the thing about this pad is it's not sloped. And so the water does not move off this pad very well. And again, it's in a location where it's, there's not a, not a gate close by to facilitate, facilitate cleaning up around uh, these feeders. Uh, it would be handy to put a gate closer to these feeders. And it would also be nice to have some sort of a concrete bunker to be able to to store that manure till a time when we can spread that manure when the weather was better. So this is another picture from the Eden Shell farm. This is the six bale hay feeder that we saw previously. And uh, they have put a manure storage there on the outside where they can run a, a front end loader or bobcat around uh, the feeder and then push it right into the manure storage so they can use it later. And this is just another set of pictures that was taken from the EdenShellFarm.com website that kind of illustrate this. So there's our concrete bunker that will be used there in the top left-hand corner. You can see where they've scra scraped around the feeder, pushed it through the gate, and there's our manure sitting there ready to be used when the weather is better for doing so. Roof designs, I mean, ideally, if we could put these uh, in a situation where we could put a roof over it and uh, um, we had good bedding or a good floor design of these, of these of a feed barn where these cattle can be dry and the feed is dry, and um, that would be great, but we don't always have those scenarios. But if we are going to put a roof on these feeders, they need to be adequate. They need to be wide and long enough to keep some of the rain out of the feeder. It needs to be oriented to allow sunlight to help dry out any moisture that does blow in on the feeder. So, again, these are some examples. The one on the left is from Lewisburg, and there's just no overhang on this feeder. So we saw a lot of rain got blown in on this feeder, and you can compare it to the Eden Shell where they put an adequate overhang to help keep a majority of the rain out of the feeder. So keep that in mind if we're going to use uh, a roof on these feeders. I think that if we are just putting in enough hay into these feeders uh, just to last for a couple of days, then a roof may not be as important. Uh, but if we are going to only feed once or twice a week, then we might want to consider putting a roof on these and it would just help those animals clean up the hay a lot better and keep that hay drier for them to do so. So the feed pad, the inside of these feeders need to be raised up higher than the actual feed pad around it. Uh, six inches higher will allow for, for that hay to be utilized better. It will reduce the amount of moisture that is wicked into the hay. And it also will reduce the amount of mud that might be kicked up into the feeder. And so here's an example here. Um, what happened in this scenario on these on these concrete feeders or these concrete pads at the Lewisburg station is that um, the person who came and poured the concrete um, then adequately planned for for raising the inside of the feeder, so they were only raised a couple of inches, and. Um, that was just not enough to keep moisture out of uh, the inside of these feeders. And so you take this scenario and you can see in the picture on the right, you can see it's obvious there's, there has been some moisture on the inside of that feeder. 
because you can see where the cows have only ate down so far and they just refuse to go any further. Uh, it's the same thing on using a chirp pad um, with the where you've seen these pictures before where we use these hay rings. There's a good 12 inches if not a few inches more of hay there that the cattle just do not want to use. And I don't blame them, but that is where moisture has wicked it from from the chirp pad. And um, so if you're going to use something like this, you need to put like some bigger rock or concrete or something to, to raise up the inside of these feeders so that moisture can wick away. And from an animal health standpoint, you know, that's, you know, if we're, we've all seen this in, in traditional hay ring scenarios where we keep feeding in the same spot all winter long. Well, that hay is wicking up moisture, but it's also wicking up um, any pathogens that might be in the manure. So really, and from a animal health standpoint, we don't want to force them to eat the bottom part of this if we're going to keep feeding in the same place all winter long and there's no way for that moisture to wash out of the inside of the feeder so be sure to build up the inside of these feeders would help on reducing hay waste then you can see uh, from these pictures here uh, at the eating shelf farm where they did raise up the inside of the feeders and you just do not see the, the amount of mud or, or the amount of moisture being held on the inside of these feeders uh, it would be a, a advantage to, to add a skirt to the bottom of these feed panels and we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. With spacing, um, a suggestion by the farm crew there at the, the education center in Lewisburg is that the width of the, the longer feeders need to be, needs to be 8 foot 6 inches. Um, that last little bit of six inches just gives equipment just a little bit more clearance to help clean out the inside of the feeders if that's needed. It's not really possible with the hay ring feeders. Those posts are about six and a half foot apart uh, when you take those two pieces from a three piece hay ring to use. Um, they do need to be wide enough, the feeders. Uh, they need to be wide enough to keep hay bales from being tight against feed panels because what's going to happen is as those cattle walk up uh, to those feeders, if that hay is, is touching um, those feed panels or the, or the outside of the hay ring, those cattle cannot stick their heads inside of the feeder and what they do is they'll take them a, a bite of hay, take a step back, and whatever happens to fall out of their mouths is going to fall out their feet. And then that hay is then trampled and wasted and those cattle will not consume it. And so if they are wide enough to where those animals can stick their heads through, they can eat that hay. Whatever drops from their mouth drops uh, back inside the feeder and can be consumed later on. So you will end up with a, a swath or a or a row of hay on the inside of these feeders that's maybe 12 or 18 inches wide and that they may not be able to reach and that's okay um, when you bring in that next hay bale you can push it to the front of the hay feeder and that can be consumed later on so here's an example here um, this feeder here is is narrower than the 8 foot 6 inches that was suggested in the previous slide uh, they were trying to use existing posts that happened to be in, in the fence line when they constructed this one. So this one is actually probably closer to seven or seven and a half foot wide. And you can see that that hay is just pressed up against that feed panel. And those animals would just take a bite and drop at their feet and it would just be wasted. It would just add to what needed to be cleaned up later on. Talking about feed panels. Um, some things that we learned on feed panels and, and one thing that I didn't include in this presentation on but pay attention to your the gauge of your metal on your feed panels if it's if it's too light of a gauge you may end up with some bent panels 
And so be sure to, to spend a little extra and, and buy a thicker gauge metal when you're using these using feed panels. Um, we just observation using a skirted feed panel is just so much better than using an unskirted um, feed panel. And going back to talking about that swath of hay that's in the middle of these feeders as those animals um, uh, feed on this hay down to the bottom of the feeder. You know, I said before, you get that swath of 12 or 18 inches and that's fine. All you got to do is take that next hay bale and push it to the front. But if your feed panel at the front of the, pan of the feeder does not have a skirt, then you're going to push feed or hay through the end of the feeder and then it'll be lost to trampling. And so spending a little extra money and getting that feed panel skirted, you're going to make up that money from the hay that you're not wasting. And so here is an example of a unskirted versus a skirted feed panel. And these two feeders were side by side, used by the same group of cattle. And you can see there on the left, the unskirted feed panels, how much hay has been wasted. Um, and a lot of it was wind blown. You know, you put in a fresh bale of hay and the wind blows and it just blows it right through the feed panel. Uh, some of it is where those cattle uh, would pull hay out of the feeder. But overall, a lot of that, you can see there's three or four feet of hay there that's being wasted because there's no skirt at the bottom of that feed panel. The one on the right, um, you can see that there's very little hay on the outside. Um, of the feed panel there's actually more hay on the ground on the on the outside on this side where we're feeding that than than there is on the inside of the enclosure there and so i think it's definitely if you're going to do this please 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 use a skirted feed panel to help reduce some hay waste and also prevent mud being kicked up into the feed and this is another picture here. Uh, this is before we put the skirted panels on this particular um, feed panel. But you can see there that the wind, or, or how, however it happened, you know, we got eight or more feet of hay that has been wasted just just because we didn't use a skirted feeder. So got you go ahead and spend extra money and put a skirted feed panel on these feeders. So hay feed and repair, you know, no matter whether you're using these fence line hay feeders or other traditional methods, you know, these areas are going to have to be repaired after hay feeding's over. And the, the thing about the fence line hay feeders, if they're put in the appropriate place um, and you do the things that you're supposed to do as far as feed pack instruction, then what essentially what we're doing is we're constricting the damage to a small area where it may be easier for us to manage that area um, to do any kind of weed control or any kind of a disking or any kind of ground repair that we might have to do is constrict, constricted to a smaller part of the farm. Uh, whereas if we're using, if we're unrowing hay or, or using the hay, hay rings and we're having to move around, then we might cause more damage across the farm. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with using the the hay unrollers or moving hay hay rings around. That's a good way of spreading manure out. But if we get the the winters like we've had the last three winters, where it's been excessively wet, we're doing a lot of damage to our pastures through through not only hoof traffic but also from tractor traffic. And so we are hurting a lot of sods, a lot of pastures. Uh, we're having a lot of runoff into creeks because of because of that. And uh, we're having to look at managing larger areas of managing weeds, weed control, or or buying seed or whatever we need to do to get these pastures back back to working. So, but this is also a question I get a lot as an extension agent every spring is what can I do about these areas and repairing them. And so we did do some plots there at the Education Center in Lewisburg in 2019 
to look at forward species and chemical options to repair these areas. And what we found was, you know, we tend to think of them as, as a wasted area, but, you know, could they also be an opportunity? You know, we fed hay in these areas all winter long. And so we know we got some nutrients that's built up there that could be used um, either as a hay crop or or used later on for summer grazing. So this is a typical scene in Tennessee, and I'm sure wherever you are, you've seen this too. But when we get done feeding hay and we move away from the area, a lot of times we, we have a lot of compaction. We'll have a lot of pig weeds. And cattle may nip the end of the pig weeds, but they will not stick their head down in the pig weeds and eat any of the grass that's growing under it. And so we've lost some pasture utilization because of the pig weeds. They can also accumulate nitrates and can be a problem if we have a drought. And so, you know, this and just the amount of area that's that is not usable can be a problem. So what we found here at the Lewisburg location is if we do a rough disket in late March, um, we can, we looked at several forest species. We looked at ryegrass, we looked at oats, we looked at fescue, we looked at clover. But by far the best forage for our part of the world was using crabgrass. And we, we had some that came from a seed bank, but we also had other treatments where we intentionally seeded crabgrass at a five pound per acre rate. Uh, we used a, a herbicide that had a residual chemical mixed in with it, so we got we had instead of just a contact kill, we had some some long-term benefit using that chemical. And um, with the growing conditions that we had in 2019, we saw anywhere from four to six tons per acre uh, using a chemical or um, plus a crabgrass mixture. And so I think there is opportunity to use these areas either for some excellent summer pasturage or if we do a good job uh, with disking or leveling the area, then we might could also get part, part of our hay harvest from these areas. But there's a YouTube link there where I talk in more detail about how to repair these hay feeding areas there at the bottom of the slide. So I want to run through some videos that we took and um, I'm going to point out some things that you may see and uh, we timed these and compared them with our fence line hay feeding systems and um, and so we'll go into that at this time. I also appreciate Dr. Jason DeKoff from Tennessee State University. He was able to do the drone videos for us and um, it really gives you a good illustration of um, from up high on what we're doing to these fields during hay feeding. So in this this video here, um, we are looking at feeding two ram bales of hay. We started from, in each one of the scenarios that we're going to go through, we started from the same hay barn. And um, this is kind of the middle section of that video that we took in this instance. It took 14 minutes to drive from um, that hay barn down to where these cows are being fed. And, um, you know, he's already had to get down off the tractor twice. This is the third time he's had to get down. He had to get down twice for opening and closing gates. Uh, this is the third time he's gotten down because he's removing the twine um, from these hay bales. Um, the heifers had access to a field next to where they're being fed hay. And, and so for this day, they were nice to him. They did not uh, congregate around the tractor. But I'm sure many of you know what that feels like uh, trying, to, trying to get down and take twine off of hay bales and move around with the tractor and have a, have a herd of cattle uh, ride around you while you're trying to do that. And so um, 
in a moment here he's going to get back on the tractor and he's going to proceed to the hay rings and um so we'll watch here this is um and this this video here was taken um first part of february so we're we're kind of right in the middle of of hay feeding at this point in time and so and what you're fixing to see here he he is going to go and feed one bale at a time he um he said he already figured out that if he carried two rows of hay at one time he was had a higher likelihood of, of getting a tractor stuck You can see here that it's a pretty large area that they were using here to to feed hay this particular winter to this group of cows. Um, they've had, uh, you can see just the different circles where they've had to move those hay rings. You can see that circle or that ring of goo around each one of those hay rings. And so we we can see that there's going to be a lot of damage just from hoof traffic but also I mean look at what uh, potentially we're going to see from from the damage that we're or the compaction that we're going to see just from the just from your tire traffic in this scenario here something he's got to pay attention to if you know if he'd had that hay bale sitting there by itself and had all them cows congregated around it then he's going to have to watch what he does with his spear so you know even though these heifers are being nice to him today i'm sure in the past he's had to pay attention uh for the safety of those those cows um the where his spear where his tractor is going but um, he does have a scenario here where he's got a little bit of a gravel road as he's entering into this field. But um, how many of you have driven through gates and it just be muddy at the gate and trying to get down off the tractor and, and work your way to to the gate and close the gate before the cows beat you to the gate and, and all that that went with it. Uh, I know for one that I can't count the many times where I've lost a boot in the mud where I've tried to hurry up and and get to the gate before the cow beat me there so that's something to you know keep in mind you know as you look at this particular video and uh, later when we compare um, the fence line hay feeding models that we're going to see okay so we're driving back towards the gate and so we're going to have to get down off that tractor two more times. Um, so he's going to have to get off once to, to open the gate. So we're going to have to watch old Baldy there on the left. And then we'll get back on and drive through the gate. And then we'll have to get down off again and close it up. So the next scenario... Um, and this is from um, the barn where we started all these from here so he's going to drive down the lane here uh, to this next set of feeders and this is going to be the hay ring feeders that were built in the fence line and uh, this particular trip here for him to feed two hay bales uh, was the took eight minutes so and it was in the field right next to where uh, the heifers were located um, so it's not much 
as far as the distance goes, there's not much difference in the distance. Uh, it's just right next door. And so, this is the same driveway he had to go down prior to with the other two bows that he just fed to the group of heifers. Um, the field that um, he's going to put these hay bales in, uh, since we were doing this for demonstration purposes, there was no cattle in this particular field that he's going to go put these bales in. Um, they had uh, drilled in rye grass in this field, and so uh, this was going to be used later in the spring. So, kind of going back to a prior comment where if you had these feeders located in different parts of the farm, then um, you know you could use those strategically within your management plan of where it needs to go. Now one thing about this particular setup that it is kind of narrow right here. And so if you are designing some of these these feed systems, try to give yourself enough room with your tractor. You may need 30 or 40 feet to be able to turn your tractor around without having to do too much backing up. But you can see where he's having to pull up and then back up um, to a place there where he... Um, can turn around and put it put that bale on the feeder now if we had a cow calf situation here we would hope that we would have gates on the back side of these feeders but uh, so that we d do not run the risk of losing any calves through the feeders but in this scenario where they this section of farm is only for developing heifers then he, they have not had any issues of heifers getting through the through these hay rings as of yet and so he's gotten down off that tractor one time here to pull the twine off um, he'll get back on he'll do the same thing with the hay ring so he's took <clears throat> at least a couple of trips off the tractor off by by using these feeders here you can see these are all on a on a chirp pad here uh, that they cleaned off in, at a prior time. Um, you can also kind of tell where we were trying to come up with some ideas on what we could use on the inside of these feeders to, to kind of prevent any moisture wicking uh, that might happen when we set these hay bales in here. So that's something we're constantly thinking about what we can do on something like these. But, um, you know, if I if you look here on a lot of these feeders here, um, I think you can I think you could put a lot eight or nine head around any one of these these feeding stations here. So if you got thirty cows, then this is probably a setup that's pretty easy to put in. You know, and, and the thing too, if you do a good job of keeping hay in them, you know, then you may not have to have the exact number of holes that you need for every cow you have you may you know you may need one and a half cows per hole that you have here in in these feeding stations here so um or these may be a good suggestion for you if you're renting land so that when when the time comes you are uh, needing to leave that or you lose that lease then you can just zip these uh, these hay rings off of these posts and you can take them with you and so you kind of get the idea you know how much a little bit easier it was for him to if there was cattle in these in this field here how much easier it would be for him to feed these these cattle he's on one side of the fence they're on the other there's no driving through gates. There's no fighting the cows off. So you're not slopping through the mud, risking yourself getting stuck or the tractor stuck. And so you can see that pretty obvious from this video. But again, the traditional way of feeding took 14 minutes. This particular video took 8 minutes. And he is getting ready to lay this hay bale down. And he is going to move back to the barn.
And our last video here <clears throat> is um, looking at putting, if you had your your uh, fence line hay feeders located close to the barn. And um, this actually took about five and a half minutes for him to feed the two hay bales. And so again, you can see we started from the same point that we did on the other two videos. All he's doing is backing out of the barn with the hay bale and he is going forward. So he gets off to cut twine, open the gate. And also, once you kind of notice too, as, um, as the drone is flying over the top of these feeders, um, it gives you a real good idea of what it looks like around these feeders. Um, if you look at a skirted versus an unskirted feeder. So you can see there with that skirted feeder, you just don't see a whole lot of hay on the outside of that feeder right there. There's some, but there's not a whole lot. And if the inside of these feeders have been built up, as I mentioned before, you know, if they were six inches higher than the surrounding feed pad, you probably would have saw a lot more of that hay on the inside of these feeders uh, being used. And he could have took that that hay bale there and, um, and pushed whatever was left forward to the end of the, of the feeder. But as such, he is going to just pull in and lay that hay bale down. And... You know, don't get caught up in feeling like you have to constantly fill these feeders up all the time. If if you got only so many amount of cattle and they can't consume the hay within a certain amount of time without it getting kind of nasty looking, uh, then only put so much as what they're going to eat in a certain amount of time. Don't you know? Put as you play with your number of head and also play with how much hay that needs to be in these feeders so i mean there's some flexibility to these systems so we're moving to that second bell now you know, he's all he's got to do is move in spare it back up and uh and then drive forward up to the feeder And I mean, there may have been some ways he could have made this go a little faster. I mean, he could probably walked up, walked over and um, opened this gate earlier. But as you're looking at designs, you know, you could have made these feeders longer if you wanted to. Or I know one producer who's going to build one of these. He's going to build it very similar to this particular setup. But he's going to put a fence in the middle. And he's going to put his mature cows on one side and his heifers on the other. And so he is able to feed two groups of animals at the same time. And hopefully give the heifers maybe, if he pulls a bell out that looks like it's going to be a little better quality than what the cows need, he can stick that in there. Um... Another thing too, guys, if you're looking at a setup like this, you know, it's very easy if I'm receiving cattle or I'm creep feeding cattle, you can put troughs on the inside of these feeders. And they could come up and and if you put a creep gate or something on the, say if this is a pen, you put a creep gate on it, you know, if those cows are, are out grazing, these calves can come up here and give them a bite of grain and uh, creep feed them that way or you could put feed panels on as your exterior to this pen and uh, feed hay and a and a grain diet at the same time so i mean you're only limited by the imagination in this notice on this feeder here since there's no skirt at the end of it you can, or around it you can see how much hay is is lost on the outside but you can see the amount of hay that's being pushed to the to the front of this feeder so 
again if you can spend a little extra money and buy a skirted panel uh, I think that's just the way to go I think what you save from reducing your hay waste is going to more than compensate you for for the for the extra money that you're going to spend on on getting a skirt put on the bottom of these panels and probably the cost on adding skirts or buying a skirted panel is probably in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 dollars extra depending on who your your um, farm store dealer is so be sure to check those out and then he's done so we're been there you know five five and a half minutes and we fed the same two bags of hay as they, we did in all the other scenarios so it could be a major reduction in the amount of time you spend feeding your so some questions that I've gotten from some producers you know I have a property but it came it comes off of a main road so I don't I don't think I could build anything like this off of a main road and again I think that's all limited based on your imagination but next couple of slides is just some ideas that I had here's an area where somebody actually builds a gravel area again you know talking about giving yourself 30 or 40 feet so you can back the tractor up you know you can have your hay feeder and your feed pad at the end and then you could also put feed panels for grain feeding along the sides but the advantage to this particular setup versus the one I'm going to show you is that you can actually turn the tractor around inside this area before you get it back out on the main road. So that just adds a little bit more safety on your part. You know, this could be also if you bring a few bales of hay down and, and lay them down here. And uh, that way you're not always traveling up and down the road with hay bales. That's another thing that you could use in this scenario. This scenario here, you're, you're kind of giving yourself this this cone-shaped gravel area to work off of, and it kind of goes into your, you kind of drive straight into your hay feeder, but then you have to back yourself out on the main road. So, you know, if you're on one, you know, a country road where you're not getting that much traffic, this may be in a way to to do these type of feeders. Uh, if I'm on a a major road I might want to have a bigger area where I can turn around and see before I pull it out on the road so don't let something like this restrict you you know use your imagination and and, and be able to do something like this opportunities to look we have these systems located at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center in Lewisburg we also have a field day the beef heifer development school each year this year it's october 22nd 2020 um, also other resources be sure to check out the eden chef farm um, they have some great blogs also dr steve higgins with the university of kentucky check out his publication um, and all the resources he's come up with they've been great great resources and then university of tennessee institute of agriculture did a youtube video where we kind of go into some a summary and examples on these fence line feeders. If you need any more information, be sure to check us out at marshall.tnc.edu.